to sit down, but I, I appreciate the warm welcome. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of the leadership here at Church on the Rise, Dr. Paul, Pastor Patty, Pastor Jordan, uh, you know, that we were serving together, and now Pastor Hestel, um, who's actually one of my good friends even before he was a pastor here. So, um, you know, it's we have so many awesome pastors here at this church. Does anyone believe that? Anyone like really appreciate that and this is one thing I want to say is you are in an awesome church that really believes in who you are and so this is the place to be grounded in to really experience God in and what amazing thing is the pastors here they're all about you finding your fit in the kingdom of God and I, you can't say that about all churches but this is a place that God really uses in an incredible way here in Cleveland it's great to be back. I love this place. When I walked in this morning, it really felt like home. It felt like I never left, except that was like nine months ago. I decided, uh, you know, I felt like Gloria's called me up to Toronto. And it's just a couple of things people ask me. No, I don't say A yet. Um, a lot of people ask me if I do. Quite frankly, I've tried my hardest not to say A. And so I don't think I'm there yet. I'm hoping I never get there because it's a little weird. And then I don't like Tim Hortons. I think it tastes awful in every way. So Tim Hortons is not good, and no, I still don't like hockey, and I probably never will. So Canada hasn't really, you know, pushed me that much into the into those things. And for those of you that are wondering, do I still like the President of the United States? Oh, yes, I love him even more than I'm in Canada. And so that was a bad joke. I should never have said it. Some of you are like, stab him, get him off the stage. Other people are like, Yes, and so we're just gonna leave that there. And so anyway, so people have been asking me how ministry's been going. It's been going really well. I mean, uh, you know, serving the church up there. But it was in November of this past year that my life totally changed. The first thing is I ended up going to Israel uh, with uh, Pastor Peter and the team, and I uh, got to see, you know, that whole side of things and help lead the trip, which was really good. And then uh, I came back for four days, and then I left on Thanksgiving. Didn't even get a Thanksgiving meal which is okay because I don't like turkey. And I left on Thanksgiving and went for Myanmar. And some people are like, where is Myanmar? It's what Burma used to be. Now they call it Myanmar. So I get on a plane and I go to Turkey. And being an American citizen in Turkey now is not really a good experience. You're stuck in the airport and you can't go out. And so here I am stuck in the airport for 12 hours. You know, everyone else, they can go out if they want. But here I am with my American passport stuck in a lounge. Thank you, Jesus. They had a Starbucks, so I was okay. And so then I flew another 12 hours to Bangkok, Thailand, and then we flew an hour and a half to Myanmar. So left Toronto, like 32 hours later, we were finally there. And so I get there, and I'm like, what in the world am I going to do? So what do I do? I find the greatest, most awesome shrine I can find, and I take a picture with it. And so this is me next to the Buddha shrine on top of this massive hill. And when I posted this on Facebook, I got hate messages telling me that I had demons in me and that demons were in my life and that that demon in the background was going to take over my soul. And I don't know, maybe I'm demon possessed now. I don't really know, but that's a picture in front of a shrine. And then, uh, so a lot of people ask me like, how do you, how do you guys do these, these gatherings? Well, the first thing is we don't call them crusades. If you say, I'm going on a crusade, and you go to a Muslim area, it doesn't go over real well. Like In their mind, they think of Christians coming and trying to kill everybody. And so crusades is really not a, a very popular word except for the American church. And so we actually call them friendship festivals. And this is where the word friendship festival comes from, is we actually meet with local leaders from different religions. So in this picture is us that we're meeting for a nice lunch consisting of roasted duck and all other kind of weird things that I'll probably never eat again. And so we're here, and uh, we're meeting with Muslim leaders, we're meeting with uh, Buddhist leaders, we're meeting with pagan leaders, just about every different kind of religion that you can think of in the city of Mandalay, Myanmar. We grab them together, we invite them, and we explain to them, you don't have to worry. We're not here to make converts. Because anywhere that Christianity is not the majority, if you say you're going to make converts, it is like the worst thing you can say. And so we tell them we're not here to promote Christianity. This is the last time you're ever going to hear the word Christianity. We're here to show the love of God 
through Jesus. And so no one gets upset about Jesus worldwide. Jesus is not the issue. The issue is Christianity. And so that's the mindset between so many people. So we go in there saying we're not talking about Jesus. We're not lifting up a religion. Or I'm sorry, we're not talking about Christianity. We're not lifting up a religion. We're talking about Jesus, and we're lifting Jesus up. And so that's what we go in to do is lift up the name of Jesus. So I have a picture of one of the crowds. I, I'm not sure which night this was, but this is me on the side of the stage taking this shooting out. And uh, so you can kind of see, I mean, it's, it's jam-packed. And, you know, I don't know which night this was, but it would have been somewhere between eight and 12,000 people were there, which is, uh, which is pretty cool for a city that's 98% Buddhist. And uh, we did it in the middle of the city, which is really cool because there's never been a gospel campaign ever in the middle of the city. So we went right in the heart of the city to do it. And I have some uh, different things to share with you guys that were really cool. This is the first picture of the first guy that was healed that came up to the stage. One problem about the picture, the dude is a Buddhist monk. And so he comes up and he shares because he, uh, he was deaf. And he shares in front of all these thousands of people in his Buddhist monk attire, Jesus healed me tonight. And that was incredible to hear that. So that was the first guy that testified. It gets better than that, though, because this is the second one. And uh, this is a, a teenage girl, and she's 17, and she had never heard one time in her entire life. Never heard once. Jesus opened up her ears after 17 years, and she got up to tell everyone that Jesus healed her. Then, another really good one is there was this uh, little girl, and she was part of a, of a school, and uh, it was a deaf school, and the teacher brought all the students. Well, I don't know if the deaf school was happy or not. I don't know if it was good for their business, because a lot of these kids that came, they heard for the first time in their lives. So they were healed by Jesus. The deaf school, they might have lost some revenue. It's okay, though, because at least she got healed by Jesus. And so that's one picture. Then this is my favorite picture. And some of you are like, why is that your favorite picture? First of all, it's not my favorite picture because how I look, because it looks like I have 47 chins there, which I don't like about the picture. But what I do like about the picture is the story behind it. So this lady was blind for over 10 years. Couldn't see. So my job in the festival is I'm on the stage and I have several translators with me. And as Pastor Peter gives the, the altar call and, and people get healed, they start running up to the stage. And it's my job with my translators because obviously I don't speak Burmese. I don't even know how to say hi in Burmese. You can see the Burmese writing behind me. I don't even know what it says besides I asked somebody who said it says you are loved. And so what happens here is they come up to the stage and it would be the equivalent of everyone in this room all running up to the stage right now all at the same time. It's totally chaotic. And so as they're coming up, we have to say, hey, what were you healed of? What were you this? That? We have to verify. That way we don't have somebody get up there and say, uh, you know what I mean? Like they actually like say something of substance. It's not like a, uh, you know what I mean? And so they come up, and, and this lady I'm talking to, and I find out she was uh, blind, and now she can see. So I told Pastor Peter, and he hands me the microphone. He says, do my job. And so I tell everyone what happens. And uh, I tell her, I say, follow my nose right? Because she's blind. There's no way she could touch my nose. It's to try to touch my nose. So she's coming at me. This picture is literally her coming after me. And we're walking. I mean, this is like 30 foot of stage that I'm, you know, taunting her with. And I'm, you know, doing this, kind of going all over. And she's trying to do it. And I'm almost falling over. But that's what this picture of is, uh, is that moment there. And the very last one is the best healing that sticks out in my mind. Not that any of them are better than any other one, but this one really sticks out. This guy's walking. And he just looks like a normal guy walking, except three hours earlier, his whole family had to carry him out of bed because he couldn't walk. And so Jesus healed him right there. The crowd went wild. The family brought up the bed. And it was, like, awesome to see that. And to really put this in perspective, uh, from the very last night, night five, I have a clip of the salvation call. So take a look at this. Say, oh God, nobody nice or not, Piyatki. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. That Jesus was buried. And rose up again. And with my mouth, 
Você não ia no fim. I confess Jesus is Lord. I change my thinking. I can't save myself. Only Jesus saves. Thank you, Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. That my sins are forgiven. So as you can see, we go in there and we lift up the name of Jesus and only the name of Jesus and that's what happens. Is people just give their lives to Jesus. And what happens, a lot of people ask me out in the lobby, I didn't explain his first service, when they, get, uh, when they decide to give their lives to Jesus, we actually give them follow-up material in their language as well as uh, you know, the Word of God in their language. So that way they're not left with nothing but they're left with something. And then we rally up all the churches we can in the area, and they connect with these people. If you saw the process, it's crazy running around, get people to fill stuff out. At the end of the, uh, you know, the five days, we had over 8,000 different uh, email, uh, not emails, but addresses of where people were at so we could have the pastors in the city follow up with them. So it's not just a one and done. We go in there to really build the kingdom. And so um, some people are asking me, is there anything going on this year? Well, there's 12 different festivals on the books right now we're hoping to get more than that uh you know the, the organization will be in ethiopia uh here at the end of march we'll also be in tanzania uh pakistan um but then the one i'm most excited for is in september because it's indonesia and some are like well are you a little excited to go on the beach or we're like what is it about indonesia what i'm excited about is i'm going to help pastor peter do his and then his team is actually setting up my very first festival right there in Indonesia. So uh, it'll be the dream that God spoke so long ago actually happening right there in September. And so, so that's what's happening with that. Uh, just a couple things before I get into the word, which I believe is if you're interested in what we do, there's a free brochure with my face on it. If you want, if you're looking to be creepy and to put this on my fridge because like he's so good looking, don't take one. But if you want to know what we do with the ministry, you know, you can take one. And it's also a free magazine with an article that I wrote on the inside of it uh, about Burma. And so Uh, feel free to grab that if you want, totally free. And then uh, we're on a campaign, and so Pastor Peter asked me to bring some of this stuff with me, is we're trying to get as many people saved as possible right here in North America as well. And so what we've done is uh, we've noticed that a lot of the tracks that people hand out, they're very, you know, what's this called? They're a little bit condemning, very Ten Commandments, you're going to rot and burn. And so what we did is Pastor Peter actually took uh, – a couple weeks and totally redesigned a, a track that's all about the love of Jesus and the gospel that we present just like the Bible does when we go uh, overseas and it's available and we're calling it the Enlightenment Project. So uh, there's these available. What's cool about it is on the back you can write your contact information so people can follow up or you can just on the back write churchontherise.net, church on the rise in the service times, whatever, so that way people have an, an opportunity to go Uh, you know, here and learn more about the gospel. And those are available in packs of 50 for 15 bucks. So our goal is to have, uh, by November, 1 million passed out in Canada, which we're pretty close to making that happen already, and 1 million in the United States. So you can be a part of that. But is anyone ready for a word that I believe is from God? Anyone ready for that? So I'm just going to share a word that I really believe the Lord spoke in a fresh way to me that totally change the way I view the gospel, the way I view Jesus, the way I view Christianity. So I hope that's okay. I'm going to share this with you after my experience in Myanmar. Um, for those of you that are youth, young adults, I have a totally different message tonight. So you make sure to come back out tonight because it's, it's totally geared towards uh, you know, our generation. So I believe that's really going to be huge. But this morning, I want to talk about the gospel in a fresh way. So one thing I noticed is When you go overseas to present the gospel, there is power in the simplicity of the gospel. There's power in just the name of Jesus. There's power in just presenting Jesus. There is power in just giving a simple truth that the gospel gives. If you read the New Testament, it's very simple. It's call on me. Meaning Jesus, not me. Don't call on me. The only thing you can call on me for is to bring you Chipotle, and I still probably won't do that. But call on Jesus. And so it's so simple, yet we've made it so complex. 
See, I want to show you a scripture that's off of Acts 4.12, and it says that by no other name, it's the salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name, no other name, under heaven which is given by men which they can be saved. And so it's also to say that there's no other name that you're saved, there's no other name that you're healed, there's no other name that you're set free, there's no other name. It's simple that it's all about Jesus, yet somewhere along the line, me and a whole bunch of other people included, I know me, talking about first-hand experience, have made it so complicated. We've made it so complicated. Like, I want you to think about this for a minute. That, think about healing, for example. We've made healing so complicated. We've said, oh, well, there's 10 steps to healing, there's 12 steps to this, there's, there's, there's four ways to position yourself for healing. What is that? That's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is Jesus heals. Yet we've made it so complicated here in the Western culture. We made it so complicated. Then there's also breakthrough's a big one. Like a lot of people are like, these are 12 keys to breakthrough. Here's, 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 here's 40 different attitudes to get you to breakthrough. When in all reality, the Bible does talk about breakthrough, and it talks about the breakthrough is found in no other name but Jesus. And so we overcomplicate it when it's really about one name. And this is my favorite one. Have you ever noticed how much power we give to demons? Oh, people love demons. Oh, they, I think they love demons more than Jesus because, they like, if you advertise we're talking about demons, everyone wants, ooh. Ooh, you know what I mean? It's like, what are they going to say? And we say like, oh, you know, the demons, and there's a demon for this and a demon for that. And, a de and all of this very well may be true. I'm not saying that the demons aren't real. But we over-magnify demons to a point that we have made the demons so powerful that there's no way Jesus can do anything for us because we've lost the sight of who Jesus is. When in all reality, the simple gospel is this. The Colossians 2.15, look at what it says. It says, and having disarmed. It doesn't say is disarming. It doesn't say is going to disarm. It says having disarmed the powers and authorities. Demons have already been defeated. Why do we give demons more power than Jesus? And it says that he made, not is making, not will make, but it says he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them on the cross is the cross a past event yes it's a past event we don't serve jesus on a cross we serve a resurrected king he's already defeated it why are we giving what he's already defeated power this is what i found we we we, we, we like to say oh you know you got to do this and you got to do that we paint christianity in this wonderful bubble that sucks to everybody outside the bubble when in all reality, no one has a problem with Jesus. They have the problem with the way that we present Jesus. And so no one has a problem with Jesus coming to heal them or to set them free or to forgive them of their sins. They have a problem with everything that we attach to it. So what ends up happening here is we overcomplicate what Jesus has made simple. You see, there's a... I'm not going to get into the long scripture because it's a lot of reading and... I like to read, but I like to preach better. So what ends up happening here is in Galatians, the Apostle Paul shows two different ways to view life. He says that there's two different women. You know, I, you know, I decided we should read it because it's better if he explains it than me explain it. So it says this in Galatians 4, 22 through 29. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by his free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. Look at somebody and say, I'm free, baby. Look at him and just say, it's got to be just like that. You've got to add the baby at the end. It's extra anointed. And so it says, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and it corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now and is in bondage with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free. It goes on to say, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. What does this have to do with anything? This has to do with what we like to do, where we overcomplicate what God has already made simple. We like to mix law with grace. Why? Because the law 
really goes after what we like as humans. Which it makes, it's about me, it's about what I can do, it's about, it's about look at me, it's like, oh, I did this and I did that, and I did, and you know, I, 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 and I, me, 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 and you know what I mean? And it's like, that's the law. It's about what you can do. But then there's grace that's about what Jesus has already done. And so the reason people like the law is because it makes them feel good. It makes them feel powerful. Look at what I did. But it really brings you in bondage because you overcomplicate what Jesus already made simple. And the bad thing is if you want a little bit of law, you get the whole law. And in turn, you can nullify the promise of Jesus on your life because you're so stuck in bondage. So what ends up happening here is we see in the next scripture in Galatians 4, 30 and 31, he says, nevertheless, what does scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son for the son of the bondwoman so not inherit the heir of the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Look at somebody and say, cast that woman out. Look at somebody and say, throw that chick to the curb. I'm not talking about a bad relationship. There are some of you in here that do need to throw that man or woman to the curb. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about law right now. What, what, the, what the Bible says is it says get rid of that. Throw that law out the window. Get rid of that bond servant. Get rid of all those regulations. Get rid of all the steps. Get rid of everything that's of the flesh that makes you feel good, that makes you feel like you're doing something, that helps someone else sell a bunch of books so they can become rich without presenting the gospel of Jesus. It says get rid of it. Get rid of it. Why? Galatians 5.1, the very next verse. Stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Some people say, yeah, that's referring to don't get into addiction and don't get into the habit. That's not what that's talking about. It's talking about the yoke of bondage, which is the law, which is all of the regulations that we think we have to do, which is all the things in our mind that we have conceived that we have to do in order to receive from God. You don't have to do anything. Jesus has already done it. That's the gospel. That, that's, why, that's why when you go overseas and you present Jesus without any of the junk, without any of the things that we like, without any of the things that aren't even biblical, so many, so many of us have taken his truth, when you present Jesus, he heals people, he sets people free, and the Muslims, the Buddhists, and everyone else that never heard of him are running to receive him because of the freedom that comes from Jesus. Yet we overcomplicate it so much that we miss the fact that Jesus wants to do something. So I got a story that I want to look at. It's in Luke 13 that I really believe illustrates this in a huge way. It may not seem like it at first, but I want you to take a look at this. It says, now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Some of you are like, you just uh, not to talk about demons. Well, I'm going to get there. Don't worry. And it says, the spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and was bent over. She's bent over, and she could not in no way raise herself up. Then it goes on to say, in the next one, but when Jesus saw her, he called, to her, called, to him, called her to him. I'm so excited to preach that I can't even read this. And it said to her, woman, you are loose. Look at somebody and say, I'm loose, baby. Look at somebody and say, I'm loosed. And then it goes on to say this in the next verse, in verse 13. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. It doesn't seem like a whole lot. There's a lot there. First off, look at this thing. It says that, that there was this woman, and, and, and she, was, she was bent over. First of all, she had a spirit of infirmity. And all the old Pentecostals said, hey, man. You know what I mean? And so... Those of us that have been around church long enough, we know the spirit of infirmity is behind everything. The spirit of infirmity is in the wall. The spirit of infirmity is in that soundboard. The spirit of infirmity is in that keyboard. The spirit of the infirmity is in this rug that I'm standing on. I hope it don't touch me. And so we all know that mindset. But you see, what does spirit of infirmity mean? Infirmity literally means, it means disabling spirit. It's mentioned one time in the Bible. One time. One time, not four times, not 257 times, one time. 
And she has this thing for 18 years. 18 actually comes from the Hebrew word yochet, which actually means the outworking of a prison or putting men in bondage. So what happens here is this woman is in complete bondage. Some of you are like, well, what does that have anything to do with me? Some of us are in bondage in the room. Some of us have a healing that we're needing, and the sickness is keeping us in bondage. Some of us have an addiction that's keeping us in bondage. Some of us have a financial situation that's keeping us in bondage. People in the room are in bondage whether we want to like it or not. It's the facts of life. There are people dealing with some things. And there are some people that don't have any bondage because they've been set free by Jesus. And so what happens here is it's a picture of us. It's a picture of us needing Jesus to get us out of bondage in some way. So what ends up happening is it's, it's kind of cool what the scripture says. It says that she was bent over and she couldn't raise herself up. So she's walking around. I want you to think about it. You were bent over, walking around. She's trying. She's trying to raise herself up. But she can't. It says there's no way, no way. Look at somebody say, no way, honey, to say no way. There is no way that she could raise herself up. So she's stuck. She's looking at the ground. Here's the thing. When you're trying to raise yourself up, you're trying to do it on your own, you're trying, you need to throw the woman out because you're stepped down. Do it on your own about you, about you, about you and what you can do. That she was trying, couldn't do it, and she didn't even know that Jesus was standing in front of her. So she's bent over and she can't raise herself up, but the one that could is right there. You may need a healing and you're trying everything, but the one that can is right here today. You may need help with an addiction and you're trying, but the one who can is right here today. You're trying, you're trying. You ever notice when you try to break the addiction on your own, it comes back with a vengeance because you cannot do it on your own. You're trying, you're trying, you're trying, you're trying, but Jesus is right there. He's right there. Now look at what happens to Jesus. Oh, I, I forgot about the demon thing. So many people want to make the spirit of infirmity the big deal. They make a whole message about the spirit of infirmity. But they lose the fact that Jesus is the one that kicks the infirmity in the face every single time. And he's standing right there. Okay, I'm going to keep on going. This is what he says. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. He called her to him. Here she is, looking down, and Jesus is saying, come to me. She's bent down. She's trying to do it on her own. And Jesus is calling, come here to me. You ever notice? Jesus never stops calling to us to come to him in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the stress, in the middle of the worst circumstances, Jesus doesn't stop calling. We lose sight of it a lot of times because we're looking down, but he called her to him. She never said, Jesus, help me. He said, come to me. In the middle of the chaos, Jesus is calling you back to him. And he says, woman, you are loosed. He says, you're loosed. You're loosed. He didn't say this. Now, follow me for a minute. He didn't say, woman, stand up straight. He didn't say it. He didn't say, woman, stand up and look around. He didn't say it. He didn't address the symptom. He addressed the root. But so many times we address the symptom, do we miss addressing the root? So we address a symptom, it's better for a day. But when we address the root, it's better for eternity. Because Jesus came not to kill the symptom. He came to take the root out. He came to rip the root right out of your life. And so what happens here is he says, woman, you are loosed. So what does that mean for us? It means addiction, you're loosed. It means, it means thoughts, you have to turn around. It means healing is coming. That's what it means. Jesus says, you are loosed. What I want you to do, stand up, give your neighbor a high five and say, I am loosed. And then sit back down because I'm not done preaching yet. 
Is anyone loosed in the house? All right, all right. Is that in here? It was bad. Is anyone loosed? All right, here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep preaching now. I'm going to keep preaching. He says, you're loosed. He didn't say, here's 10 steps for your back to feel better. He didn't say, woman, you need breakthrough. You better position yourself, right? He said, you're loosed. He's saying, you're loosed because I walked in the room, and when I walk in the room, it has to be loosed. Because when you let Jesus walk in the room, everything else has got to go. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is Jesus will do it for you. Look at what happens next. It says that she was made immediately straight and glorified God. When? When Jesus' hands touched her. She tried for 18 years. One touch from Jesus. Not 10 steps. Not 43 and a half things. Nothing. She didn't have to give anything. She didn't have to do anything. She just had to respond to the one that was calling her. And she was loosed. It's the simplicity of the gospel, and it's all about Jesus. It's not about anything else, it's about Jesus. Some people are saying, well, 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 what about me? What about now? What about, what about my thoughts? What about this? And worship team, you can go to come on out because we're about ready to go ham in this place. And so it's just like, 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 what about me? This is, she died 2,000 years ago. Ooh. And so what I want you to know is this. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean? That means that Jesus that loosed that woman then will loose you now. That means that that sickness that's on you, you come to Jesus, it has got to go. That means that addiction you can't get over on your own. When Jesus walks in the room, you have got to let it go. It means that when Jesus walks in, nothing else can. Because when Jesus walks in, you are loosed. You're loosed. That means there are people in the room that are dealing with addictions to pornography. Don't act like it's only a teenage thing. It's an adult thing, too. You're loose this morning. It means in financial situations, the, the, root is not the, 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 the root is not that you have a problem with money. The root is you have a problem seeing yourself. You're loose this morning. It means if you need a healing, it is loose this morning. You need to understand that when Jesus walks in the room, it doesn't matter what anybody else said about you. All that matters is Jesus says that you are loosed. Somebody look at your neighbor, high five, and say, I'm loosed. It's because of Jesus that you're loosed. Now who's ready to experience the simple gospel of Jesus? If you're in the room, and you need a healing in your body. I want you to stand up where you're at right now. Pastor Peter called me last night. He said, just pray like you saw the prayers happen in Burma and watch what happens. So here we go. Are you ready for it? You need a prayer. Raise your hand. I want you to know this is everything to do with Jesus. Jesus, your gospel has been preached, and you always back it up with power. Now I ask that you would touch the people and show yourself to them and loose them. I speak to all those that need healed, to every root, to every spirit behind it. There's even someone in the room that has has blindness in one eye. You're going to get your sight back right now. There's someone else that there's a hearing issue. Get ready. It's coming back right now. In Jesus' name, I speak to every spirit of infirmity, every spirit of deafness, every deaf and dumb spirit in the room, 
and I speak to that thing and I say, come out in the name of Jesus. Now begin to move your body like you haven't moved it before. And if you've been healed, give Jesus a shout of praise. How many people, they know they were healed this morning? Hand there, hand there, hand there, hand there, hand there on the side, hand over there. You're physically healed here this morning. It's because of the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus alone. That's what it's about. It's not about anything else. It's not about anybody. It's not about, about any idea. It's about the name of Jesus. And so what we're going to do here is whatever you need, we're going to give Jesus a shout of praise that it's already done. Now how we're going to do this is on the count of three, I need you to give Jesus the biggest, loudest, craziest, most ridiculous shout of praise, dancing in the aisles, high-fiving your neighbor, going nuts like you're at a Cavs game and I actually want something. I need you to go nuts like Jesus is in the room because he is on the count of three. I need you to give Jesus the biggest, loudest shout of praise that Cleveland has ever heard because he is in this place. His name is Jesus and he has healed. He has set free on the count of three. One, two, three.